who likes lightning talks? <laughs> Woo! Who likes lightning talks down the brutal way with the Kathy? <laughs> Excellent. So, under Kathy's lightning talk regime, there will be no questions. I'm sorry. Um, I have made all of the lightning talk speakers email me their slides in PDF format. The PDFs will be clicked through. They have five minutes, including setup and talkie talkie time. So, let me get off the stage and introduce my good friend, Mr. Stephen Ellis. Awesome. Right. Any of you from New Zealand that are using, consuming, dealing with open source, I, you are here. You should be a financial member of the New Zealand Open Source Society. We've been a bit quiet of late. We are actually doing a lot more advocacy this year, and we really need your help. We have a new updated mission statement. I know it seems a bit wordy. These things happen by committee, but this is our mission statement. Share the freedom of open source software, open standards, and open information for the benefit of New Zealand. So please do try and get involved. Why do one? I'll do two, two lightning talks. Who of you were at LCA last year in Auckland? So you may notice we gave away a few of these. And someone said, do they run Linux? Well, they're ARM, they're Chromebooks. I'm sure we can make them run Linux. Turns out not quite so easy. So um, it was one of those things that was really starting to bug me. Hang on a minute, no one's blogged about this. None of the people we gave them to have said, we've now got it running Linux, so I made it work. Um, there's a few guys out there. The best bet, because it has very little storage, is to use an uh, MMC card. Um, a couple of the standard tools are missing, which is really frustrating. So we used a few of the guides online, documented it all. It's all up on GitHub, all the scripts, all the tips, all the how-tos, patches welcomed. But that was only part of the answer, because my daughter, she loves Minecraft. She spends an amazing amount of time in Minecraft, and I've suddenly got this quad-core, Tegra accelerated, Linux running laptop for it to use playing Minecraft. Pocket Edition is pretty much the only option. Doesn't really work for my daughter. She needs too many features. So while Minecraft uses Java, turns out OpenJDK on 32-bit ARM, not so good. Stuck with the Oracle JVM. And Minecraft actually ships with x86 binaries. Who knew that? Yay! 32-bit, 64-bit x86 binaries to do graphics and audio. Without them, doesn't run. So there's a script to fix all of that. So it means on that machine now, she has hardware accelerated really, really fast Minecraft. Awesome, happy daughter. This is my call to arm, or call to arms. Please consider other architectures. Sorry, can't help it. Look, we've had talks this week about other CPU architectures. Uh, Stuart did an amazing talk about the work going on around power and PowerPC and other architectures. This is important. The future of open source isn't just x86. If any of you work with Oracle or have some sway at Oracle, please encourage them to treat OpenJDK as a proper upstream. If you're a developer, build for other architectures, ship on other architectures, and test on other architectures. Please, there is more to life than x86. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, do we have Geordie Miller in the house? You're up, Geordie. Uh, you are Katie. Please start the timer. Sorry, I'm here to talk to you about an open source project. Sorry, I'm here to talk to you about an open source project I've been working on for the last two or so years. Open source GPS and map sharing. It's called Stack Pointer. A um, little bit about me, I'm in REA's realestate.com.au's grad program. It's a nice place to work. If you're near the end of your uni degree, apply for it. Uh, so this is what the interface looks like. Um, it may look similar to another location sharing product that used to be offered by a certain major search engine, um, just with a few additional features. Uh, what is it? It's written in Python on Crossbar. Crossbar provides you with RPC and PubSub functionality. What that means is you can basically do API calls and get events pushed to you over a WebSocket instead of polling a REST API. So you get updates immediately as they happen. Uh, this means all of the icons on the map move around as soon as someone pushes an update. 
Um, it still has a REST API though um, for other clients and a few things that are really handy to have it for. And yes, it does have Swagger. Uh, so what is it so far? There's an Android client written, iOS is to come. I do know Swift, uh, so that is going to happen. Uh, I would like to make the client a little more native in future. It's kind of largely web view based for the map. Um, so if you're thinking of doing a similar small project, um, why would you make it open source? Uh, the reasons that were most important to me were that firstly, you can know what your data is used for. Secondly, if the source is available, and this is made a lot easier by the source being available, not just binaries, you can run your own private instance. You can easily modify it to integrate with other things. And if I abandon the project, you, any of you can continue development. And any of you can also contribute any features you may want to see. PRs gratefully accepted. So what does it do? Um, you can share your GPS location with other users or a group of users. Uh, we've, a bunch of us have been playing with it so far at this conference. Um, that is what the LCA group looks like at the moment. Uh, you can, yeah, you can then, as soon as said event is over, remove yourself from the list of users sharing location to that and, yeah. Um, you can create a group, add place marks and drawings, and coming soon in the client is functionality to just go put a pointer right at this spot where I am, or share a location out to another app, so you can, say, push it to another app to navigate to here, or that sort of thing. Uh, related, I also run an OpenStreetMap tile server. If anyone has an open source project that wants OpenStreetMap tiles that look a lot nicer than a lot of other providers, um, talk to me. I'm running it for this. I may as well get more people using it. Uh, and yeah, the sign up. Um, Stackpointer.com slash registration. Put LCA 2016 into the invite code field if that's still there by the time you sign up. Uh, it's on GitHub at stack underflow dash stack pointer. I went for the combination approach because both were taken by other people. Uh, Stackpointer.readthedocs.org if you want to see the technical documentation. And the app is up on Google Play. Um, if you don't like Google Play, grab the source code, compile the a APK yourself. Um, I will work on getting that into FDroid in the future. Um, yeah, or just search for Stack Pointer if that URL is a bit too long. Um, if you want a sticker with the logo on it, uh, come find me afterwards. Any questions, come talk to me afterwards. Thank you, Jordy. Thank you, well done. Next up, Katie Miller. I'm not Katie Miller. Sorry, Katie. Oh. oh, come on. I'm running on four hours sleep. I'm so sorry, Katie. That's okay. I'll embarrass you in a couple of minutes. Okay. <laughs> Hello. We're going to build a hat rack. This is a hat rack. So we do a lot of open source stuff. We write code, we do servers, we go to conferences occasionally. A lot of this we have in little graphs and stuff that you can see on GitHub. And when you've got a nice green graph, everyone thinks you're an awesome developer. But what about everything else? What about the conferences we attend? What about the mentoring? What about the leadership? What about all these amazing people in this room? And there's a lot of you, hi. You're all awesome for being here, by the way. You need a clap. Clap. Yay. We're going to be doing that a lot, so stop when I say stop. OK. so. How can we acknowledge all the stuff we do that's not code, that's not automatically aggregated? Let me tell you a story. At this conference last year, two ladies had coffee. Their names were Leslie Hawthorne and Deb Nicholson. Woo! Uh, they're both members of the Savannah Software Foundation, and Leslie was congratulating Deb about the fact that she got accepted onto this board. And Deb thought, it's absolutely amazing. This is something that I can put on my LinkedIn and say, I've helped someone, and it's a really good place to hang my hat. 
Leslie, being the amazing enabler she is, decided to write a blog post about this and turned it into a hashtag. L-A-B-H-R, let's all build a hat rack. Five simple steps. Think about someone who you think is amazing and you want to tell the world about them and write down a list and send it to them. If you want to be extra awesome, put it on Twitter because then you can share that out with a wider world of people that may not necessarily know, especially within the scope of a project. You can expand that and just say they're awesome in general. And you could recommend them on LinkedIn and help them get a job. And do it for someone that's not like you. This is the main bit because in our societies, we're very secular. And if we branch out, we can bring in diverse people and we can grow our networks and we can be awesome. And everyone's really happy. So I'm a developer. I automated this. For GitHub, I have a project called OctoHatRack. What this does is normally in GitHub, you only see the code contributions in master, this thing gets out everything else. The issue requests, the bug tracking, the code reviews, everything that's not normally represented in your little graph, but the data's in GitHub, this does it. And I've had a wonderful conversation with John O'Bacon about this, and we might be talking later after this conference. It's really exciting. But here's how to be nice. Kathy, David, Everyone in orange shirts, this week has been amazing. Between the two of you, you've brought hundreds of people into your hometown and you facilitated so much engaging, interesting conversations and this, this entire conference is awesome. And all the volunteers and all the AV people and all the facilities people and everyone here needs to know, we need to tell all these people that they're awesome. So you've got time for clapping now. I got you back, girl. Someone remind me never ever to embarrass Katie again. Next up, Chris Nogavau. Okay, so this thing here, this is a conference for people who like Linux, who like open source stuff. Now, some of you in this room might like developing things with Python. It turns out that Australia has a conference for people like you. It's called PyCon Australia. Now, over the last few years, since 2010, it's been to Sydney, it's been to Hobart, and for the last two years, it's been in Brisbane. This year, it's moving to its fourth city, Melbourne. That's really exciting. It's uh, being hosted at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre right on South Bank. And it's going to be running in mid-August, the 12th to the 16th. Uh, on the first day, we have, um, we're expanding on the mini-confs that we've run at PyCon AU for the last few years and running our usual DjangoCon, our Science and Data mini-conf, and our Python in Education Day. But we're also opening it up to other specialist events, which you'll hear about in coming days. Um, the 13th and 14th are presentation days for things about everything to do with the Python ecosystem. And the call for proposals for that will open in mid-March. So if you do stuff with Python and want to be in Melbourne in August, uh, you should really think about submitting a talk. Uh, PyCon Australia also has a really generous financial assistance program. So if you don't think you're able to afford it or you need help with travel, uh, we run financial assistance for everybody who needs it. So if you want to find out more about PyCon Australia, you can go to our website or you can follow us on Twitter. And there is, of course, another Python conference in the general area, and Tom Eastman is going to tell you a bit about that. Hi. Hi. I have slides too. Who's been to Kiwi PyCon? <laughs> Hell yeah. Kiwi PyCon is the coolest little conference in New Zealand. It is the friendliest little conference in New Zealand. It's wonderful. Uh, it's in its eighth year. It's older than PyCon AU. I am delighted this year to tell you that this year's Kiwi PyCon is being held in my old hometown where I learned Python, where I learned computing, and where I met a lot of you fine people when LCA was there in 2006 in Dunedin. You all want to come back, don't you? And we have a very pretty place where we're holding it. We are holding it in the town hall. It's going to be fantastic. And 
We know that some of you might have a couple of concerns about how much time have I got. Yep, cool, plenty. Um, some concerns about you know New Zealand's reputation. So, do I have a green? Oh, it's not a green laser pointer. But here is a graph of 10,000 earthquakes in New Zealand. Look where Dunedin is. We got you covered. You'll be fine. I guarantee an almost earthquake-free Kiwi PyCon. <laughs> so the announcement website's not up yet. It's going to be held on the weekend of, the, of September 11th, which is easy to remember for sad reasons. But our website will launch very soon. It's at kiwi.pycon.org, which is really easy to remember. Kiwi.pycon.org. It rolls off the tongue. Try it with me. Kiwi.pycon.org. And for the first time ever, we're running sprints. And what we're doing this year, which is pretty cool, is we're going to be teaching people how to be core committers. We're going to have a sprint where we're going to have core CPython developers, core Python developers, mentoring people to commit to Python. So check it out. Uh, you'll, you'll hear from me. I'll make noise when the website launches. But those are the dates, and that's going to be the website. Thank you very much. Hi. Sheree Ellis, GovHack. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Now, a few years ago, some of you might remember Pia War standing here at a lightning talk talking about this project that she was about to get involved with called GovHack. Because I remember sitting there in the audience and nodding and thinking, that's a great idea. You are bonkers. Now, people ask me, what, uh, am, am I hacking the government? Are we hacking the government? It's like, hello, it's not the 80s. We're not watching Warcraft, whatever the hell that movie was. But it does bring to me images as a Kiwi of our legendary Maori legend Ma Maui hacking away at his great fish with his grandmother's jawbone. Yeah, nah. Now, there's lots of reasons to get involved with GovHack, to go as an attendee or even to actually create uh, an event yourself. For you, really, the biggest reason is to have fun, OK? But realistically and ultimately, what GovHack actually is, is about opening up the government, getting open up, open up, open up, yep, thank you, um, and getting the government to open up their data by showcasing what can actually be done with it. Now, it's been going on in Australia for a few years now under Pia's care, and it's become extremely successful, the event itself, to the point that last year there was 24 events, uh, over 1,600 people in Australia. New Zealand came on board and we had seven events and over 400 registrations. In total, there was over 300 hacks that happened, which I think was pretty cool. Now, we're going again this year because one thing I know, like Pia did, is that you people like to be creative. It's what drives you to do the sort of amazing things that you do. I also know that there's actually a few people here at LCA who have been to a GovHack in New Zealand or Australia. So seek them out, see if you can find them. If any of you are keen to actually stand up and be counted now, that'd be cool. Have your faces shown so that people can come and find you and so that find out for themselves what it's like to be involved with GovHack. Because, oh, and you can always find me. <laughs> I tend to be around. Now, if we return to asking, or return to the comment of a hack being a way of modding something, changing something in an extraordinary way, we then again go back to the question, are you trying to hack the government? The answer is actually maybe yes we are, but in a good way. Come and join us. Thanks. Just bear with me a couple of minutes. We're going to do some technical black magic here. And uh, I'd like to invite Bron Gondwana up to the stage. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for getting this sorted out. Uh, my slides didn't get emailed through. And so I can use the arrow keys. That's fine. JMAP, a better way to email. Email, believe it or not, is not actually dead. It's still the world's biggest social network. And it's a lovely standard thing. There are heaps of standards to choose from. In fact, there are tons of them, and they are all awful. Look at that list there. POP3 plus SMTP, POP, yeah. IMAP plus SMTP, Active Sync stuff, all of that. None of them are great. So what happened? Everyone said, this sucks. We're going to write our own API. 
And there's a proliferation of them, including in grey down the bottom there, the Fastmail API. About four years ago, we realised we needed to make a nice API for our friendly JavaScript web interface to talk to our backend servers. And we designed our own API, and it's 3,000 lines of spec. Yeah, you've seen this before. So what did we do? We went, I plus one is J, right? It's JSON, right? JMAP. It's JSON over HTTPS. There's a single API for email, for calendar, for contacts. We're going to be adding other things to that. It's friendly, and I'll talk about the friendly a little bit more over the next few slides. I've done these slides a couple of times over the last few years now. The good thing is we're getting close to actually having something you can use. Or you could just become a Fastmail customer. Our customers have had this for the last four years or so. If I can flick up the web page at the end of this talk, if I've got time, I'll show you how much better it is than what you've got now. Unless you're one of our customers, there's heaps of you in the audience, I know, you've come and said hi. It's friendly for support. IMAP plus SMTP, you get firewall issues, you get misconfiguration issues. One protocol's working, the other one doesn't. That's actually really hard for people to understand. It's really unfriendly. All working, all not working is much easier to understand. It's friendly to the network and friendly to your battery. It batches commands. Yeah, Twitter. Hi, people. <laughs> it batches commands and sends them through all at once. So it, and it uses the out-of-band notification systems built into your phone or built into your browser even these days, rather than needing to keep a long-running connection. It's got windowing controls, so that you're never pushing all the data all at once. You say, give me all the updates. IMAP can say, here's the million items that just got deleted. Expunge one, expunge one, expunge one, expunge one. That never happens with JMAP because it's designed to have windowing in place. You say, tell me all the updates, and it says there's a million. Are you sure? No, I'll just fetch the first 30 messages again and see them. And finally, you need an upgrade path. IPv6 adoption shows if you don't have an upgrade path, it takes a long time. We've built a proxy. It works. It has everything except the authentication part of the spec, fully functional. The people who are building things like Roundcube Next on top of JMAP are using this proxy for their testing right now. And finally, of course, it's all totally open. The spec is available, the proxy source code is available, or you can use the one that we're hosting, and everything's on GitHub. Tests, Alfie's out here somewhere, I'm sure, is going to be starting developing this stuff next week. He's cleared his plate, JMAP tests, and by tests, I mean an acceptance test suite for servers, so someone else who develops a server isn't just reading the spec, they're testing it. That's all I've got there. Now, if I can very, very quickly find a web browser, I may even be able to show you what the Fastmail interface looks like. I will be changing my password straight after this, obviously. <laughs> don't want to remember that. <laughs> so this is loading from our servers in New York. Of course, it's going to be slow on this network, isn't it? There you go. I've got 6,000 messages in my inbox. I can scroll to the middle of that as if it was a continuous scrolling thing. And there's messages from months ago, just loading. Can go to message folders. Now, I believe Rob was going to send me an email. And we get to see push. It's going to work. It never works. There it is. Hey, mister. Thank you. And then I can delete that from my phone, and it will just disappear. <laughs> I should have turned Twitter off, shouldn't I? <laughs> there we go. Delete, push notification. You saw it got red, and that just disappears. That's pushing through the Android push channel, and then pushing back through event source there. And I think I'm done. Thank you very much, JMAP. It's open. Enjoy it. <laughs> Thanks very much, Bron. I'm just going to log out. I always got a remote log out too. I could log that out from my phone. No worries at all. Good thing he did it before his time ran out. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. Up next. Sorry, did you have slides? Yeah. Okay. Let's see if I can find your slides. I'm at the end of the slides I had. That's my phone. It's all right. Twitter. I don't oh, suppose. Hi. Do you have the slides anywhere else? I do, but I just do without. Are you sure? Yeah. All right, so I'm Martin. Hello. Um, one of the things I overheard at this conference is that DevOps is just another name for a sysadmin without the experience. <laughs> but 
to be fair, come on guys, it's not true. We've seen, we've seen a hell of a lot of uh, innovation coming out of DevOps in the last couple of years. Continuous integration, all the system autom automation stuff, etc. I'm not going to bore you with a long list. But what we've also seen with all these tools is that they are doing their own thing. They are re-implementing wheels that the Unix world has solved over the last 40 years. And I'm here today to sort of give you the back this idea that we could, now that we've seen all this innovation from the cloud and seen all these great products, return to the Unix principles and think about what it is that makes Unix so strong. Do one thing, do it well, and provide interfaces. In this spirit, I've uh, started a couple of years ago to take inventory management and put it out into a tool of its own so that all your information about your servers are stored in one central place and it doesn't actually matter anymore whether you run Puppet or whether you run Munin or whatever. They all use the data from one source. And my next project uh, on this is uh, going to be the transport layer. So what I would like to do is uh, implement something that I sometimes call the SSH botnet. Um, it's the idea that you have persistent connections between your hosts and you can rely on the fact that these connections work. So that when you have a problem, you just do a bisect of the problem space and you say, it's not below the transport layer so I can ignore everything to do with IP and so on and so forth and I can just focus on the actual application that might and, and hopefully make debugging a little easier. So unfortunately, I don't have any links to share with you, um, but I guess if you hit reclass into uh, uh, your favorite search engine or uh, follow me on Twitter, Martin Kraft with a double F, then uh, I shall be posting some information. And uh, with that, I, I've done enough. Thanks, Martin. Our next lightning talk does need a little bit of setup. So I believe it's going to be a terminal demonstration. Okay. Yes. Yep. So we'll see if we can set you up. <laughs> yep. Go for it. Whatever that is. Yep. So this is the last talk in our our full slot of. Oh, oh, sorry, Keith. We have one more after this. I'll get you to go up there. Thank you. Two more. I've got two more. Oh, bad organizer, aren't I? I know you have to sack me. Yeah. <laughs> Back up your desk. You're out at the end of the day. <laughs> Who do we have up after Keith? Well, the good news is we've got Keith Packard on stage. This is not working, actually. I guess this is a for. Sorry? Uh, it's not working like this before. And uh, it's, not, it's not going. So, yeah. You can do stuff right on that side. No, I have a full reserve list as well. Yeah. Is that working or working? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In the meantime, just in case. Uh, Start off. There you go. Uh, just in case. I'm not able to make it, hopefully I will. Uh, essentially, uh, my name is Moriano. If I sound uh, nervous, it's because I am. Uh, essentially, uh, I've been talking to a lot of people, and when I mention to them, oh, what do I do? I say, well, I do backend development, this and that, and I also do a bit of machine learning. And when I say that, everybody seems really excited. And some people even look, you know, think it's a very kind of uh, difficult thing or magical thing that requires you to know a bazillion things. And actually, it's not. Uh, at least to do the very basics, to do like deep learning like Google does or Facebook or God knows what, possibly it is, but to do the basics is not. Uh, what, I am, uh, what I want to do is to make a very simple demo of uh, six lines of code in the R language that to me is the equivalent of a hello world in machine learning, just to, uh, you know, to make everyone curious and to show that it's actually not that difficult. And uh, well, let's see if it works or not. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I didn't need to do the X run thing. Oh, there you go. Thanks. Uh, I just go to the other terminal. Uh, yeah, that's okay. I will try to. I will try to do it like that. Okay. So, as I said, uh, give me a second. Stay with me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, man. You're the best. 
I'm really nervous. Okay, so I'm gonna be on my knees, okay, because I, so I can see the screen. But just imagine that I'm on normal, you know, height. Um, <laughs> so first line of code with uh, R. This thing, plot cards. Uh, the very first thing that this uh, does is to actually came out with a uh, with a plot. You know, yeah, that's awesome. We have. Uh, you know, um, what's the name, a, a chart. That is essentially a data set that comes for free, you know, or included or bundled in R, and it shows uh, essentially the x-axis is the speed of a car, the y-axis is the distance to stop, okay? That's it. Uh, now, next line, and this is the most cool line, is that one. That essentially creates a linear model that is able to predict the distance that a car is going to need to stop given the speed that it's running, okay? That single line is actually the machine learning. That's it, as simple as that. Now, if I, uh, I can plot now this um, line, and that might not look like something very exciting, right? But actually it is, because of all the infinite lines that I could have draw, that particular one is the best that can predict you the values, okay? And I have came out, or the algorithm came out with the best line out of infinite possibilities in a non-infinite number of steps. And that is extremely uh, exciting. Although I, it may not look like that, but trust me, it is. Uh, now, the cool thing is that I can create new data, okay? And essentially, I'm saying that what happens if I have a car that is going at a speed 21? And that speed has never been seen before by the system, okay? 30 seconds, let's go, I can do this. Okay, and uh, the thing is, I can use my model with the new data to make a prediction, and that prediction, okay, came out as 65. Okay, if you look, possibly you cannot see it very well, but that's actually a correct prediction. The cool thing is that it doesn't matter how many variables you add. This is two variables, it could be it could be four variables, or three, or two, or whatever. Thank you, guys. Congratulations. Well done. Very, very good use of timing. Uh, to the slides. Yeah, did I send them to you? We don't have them queued up for you. We didn't get them. <laughs> Slides. Sorry, I'm, I'm totally going to get sacked. You know, he's told me to pack my desk. I'm out at the end of the day. Oh, okay, hello everyone. Hello. Uh oh. Uh oh. Yes. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about um, about gratitude as well. Um, but mostly, I want to say what I'm grat grat grateful for, and that's. Um, for LinuxConf for making me feel like a kid again, and maybe a little bit foolish. Um, it makes me feel like a kid again, not only from like the sense of awe and the sense of wonder, but also from my knowledge, because I stomp around a lot going, you know, I am so great, I, am so, I know everything, you know. And then I come to LinuxConf, I know nothing. Um, so uh, if I could ask someone to be my microphone stand, yeah, it's the last thing you have to do for the conference. So. Um, I'm just, I wrote a song about it, and uh, do you want to hear it? Well, I'm going to play it anyway. <laughs> I don't go to swap meets, code my watch, or sign my mail. Ain't been on no tour networks, I'm afraid I'll go to jail. <laughs> I can't repartition ZFS to save my life. I lied about being the technical type. And sure, I can get merge, get bash, get pull out the bash prompt like a champ. But when a three-way merge came up in Vim, I nearly crapped my pants. I just reset hard and copied in what I think was right. I lied about being coder type 
Too afraid to let you know I jewel boot back into Windows And I'm hardly Wi-Fi Zen So thank God for OS X I lied about being The gadget guy Don't own an Arduino Let alone a Raspberry Pi But I still come to Linux Conf And I still like to pretend Cause while I don't have lead skills, I made a lot of friends. So I hope that you'll join me for a drink tonight. And yes, I'm sure about being the drinking type. Yeah. My goodness gracious me. Let's hear it again for Duncan McNeil. Mr. Keith Packard. Dang. <laughs> All I get to do is generate white noise instead of pretty noise. <laughs> Okay, uh, I have actually finally built something I think is worth, uh, worth actually using called Chaos Key. How many people like random numbers here? Everybody likes random numbers. How many random numbers do you like? All the random numbers. We finally managed to generate a device which, generate, which saturates a USB link with random numbers. Uh, Chaos Key generates a megabyte per second of randomness. Uh, Chaos Key started with the random number source from 1RNG. Uh, it was a fine random number source. It had one little problem. It didn't generate random numbers very fast. Uh, so I, st I stole their fine noise source and pumped it into a, uh, a nice op amp and then into an ADC into a microcontroller and stuck it on a circuit board. It looks like that. That's the prototype. It has an STM FO32, STM32 FO42 processor um, and a nice little USB connector. Um, I have a couple of those here. Um, and that has a little noise source. I don't think you'll be able to see it. It's somewhere on the board there. Uh, the plan is to put it in a new package because we all like smaller because smaller is cooler. Yeah, so here's the package it's going to go into. I found a smaller version of that processor, four millimeter square, uh, four millimeter square 28 lead uh, QFN, which you can see the little black square in the upper uh, left-hand corner of the, pro of the package. This is another board I built with the same processor uh, to prove that I could actually build that, build something with that processor in this little package. Uh, the driver, the awesome part is the driver is already in your Linux distribution. If you're running Linux uh, 4.3 or better, it even has the bugs fixed in it. <laughs> Yay! So a couple of people around, the, around this week, I managed to plug it into the laptops and it's like, whoa, my entropy is full. It's awesome. Uh, what's this really useful for? It's not really useful for laptops because we have uh, random number generators connected to all of our laptops. That would be you. Uh, but for servers, it's really awesome, um, and it automatically hooks itself up to the dev random source, so it takes absolutely no user-level code. You literally take the device, plug it into a machine, and your machine is now full of entropy. Um, I actually have the, the weak part in my, whole, in my whole plan. Isn't that awesome? I snapshotted, I snapshotted a page from uh, Firefox and generated a PDF from it, converted the PDF to SVG, and stuck the SVG in my slide. And the only thing wrong with the whole process is it flipped over the logo, and I have no idea why. <laughs> it's hilarious. Oh, the all other awesome part is before I uploaded my sample data to this site, there were like 100 random number generators listed. And after I uploaded my new data to CA certs, a random number tester, I'm the only one listed. It must be that mine is the best, and they just wiped out all the other ones. Oh, you just want to go get this new one. Um, I don't really know how to test random number generators. Uh, anybody know how to test them? I only, the only, yeah, see, we have a couple of people that know how to test them. Well, I've done, I've done a million kinds of testing, but if anybody has any information, I would love to just ship you some random bits and have you tell me that they're random. <laughs> Literally, that's what these guys wanted. I said, well, how much do you want? And they said, well, how about 20 megabytes? And I said, I can do that. It takes 20 seconds. So I uploaded 20 megabytes, and then I, uh, then I got this result. And it says, hey, your random number generator generates actually random values. Uh, so plans right now are to continue testing it, of course. Um, I'm probably going to do another the prototype in a small size to make sure it actually works. Then I'm going to build some. Uh, and then I'm going to build a little pile for wider testing, and then eventually I'm going to build a huge pile. I'm hoping to sell them for about 30 bucks. So if you're interested in this, if you're interested in helping me test this, 
uh, send me mail and easy to find. Um, uh, and uh, I can send you random numbers to run through uh, as much stuff as you want. I've run it through uh, Die Harder, of course, and Die Harder said, oh, it's awesome. But as we all know, Die Harder is like, well, if you fail at Die Harder, you have basically failed at life. So, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Thanks very much. Unfortunately, we won't have time for those of you who are on the reserve slots for lightning talks. I did see mysteriously that the wiki page got extended from 8 to 9 to 10. You thought you'd pull that past me? But I have let it through. Um, we are going to go straight through. We'll need a couple of minutes to set up for our conference close. So if you do need to pop out of the room for a couple of minutes, now is the right time to do it. And we'll be with you shortly. Thank you. Seats, please. 
Easy volume control. <laughs> Not that. week it's been hasn't it Hell yeah. yeah huge thank you to uh to brett james who did a lot of the video editing work there let's hear it for brett so welcome to the closing um it's been a fantastic week thank you everyone for joining us in geelong in our hometown um, it, it's been terrific. I don't know the number of times I looked at my email and went, oh my god, there's people going, where can we go for dinner in Geelong? And it's, it's been really sort of weird. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you to all of our speakers and mini-conf organisers. Um, can we have all of them stand up? Sorry, I'll only and do I this once this are. time. <laughs> Big round of applause. Thank you. Um, without you, this conference wouldn't have been possible. Um, you're the people everyone paid to come and see. Um, it's been fantastic that we could have so many of you here. Um, and I hope to see you all speak again next year. It's, it's been really good. And thank you for making my life so easy as well. Um, often being speaker liaison is uh, a hard task. And the speakers and mini-conf organisers this year have made my job incredibly easy. And for that, huge, huge thank you. Um, so our speaker gifts this year. Saw a couple of posts on social media and a few people are a little confused. Uh -huh. <laughs> so just to clarify, um, they're replicas of um, some bollards that the Geelong City Council commissioned an artist, uh, Jan Mitchell, um, to build out of old pieces of timber, old um, pylons from piers and, and the like. Um, there's about 104 of them all throughout Geelong. Um, there's, there's a whole walk that goes past all of them and you know you, things that you spot like a rabbit painted on the, the backs of them or um, you can go up and read the newspaper on one, there's one reading a newspaper. Do we have any ingress players in the house yet? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> have a look on your secret missions, there is a bollard secret mission. Yeah, um, um, and so it's a, it's a great piece of history of our, our town and we wanted to share that with you and give you something to take away, um, to remember us by. Um, one, for one last time, we wanted to thank our fantastic sponsors again. Um, without them as well, um, we wouldn't have been able to have such a fantastic venue, we wouldn't have been able to have um, such fantastic events throughout the week. Um, so, to our sponsors, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Um, they've been a fantastic help. Um, they send a large number of people as well, which is fantastic. Um, IBM as well. Um, another long-time supporter of Linux.conf.au. Um, it's been fantastic to have them on board. Our King Penguin sponsors, Arnet, um, for providing Steve Walsh um, and all of the internet for us to use as well. Um, we have some numbers on that in just a little while. Um, and again to Deakin University for providing the spaces we're using um, and for providing me with way too many of their staff um, and all of their time. <laughs> Thank you. Our Royal Penguin sponsors, uh, Red Hat, our local John company, Codacious, um, and Catalyst. Um, Catalyst also provided uh, one of our spot prizes earlier in the week. Um, so whoever it was that won that, I hope you really enjoy it. Thank you. Um, and to our Delhi Penguin sponsors, Elastic, Optiva, Optiva, had a discussion, still not sure how to say that one, um, and Google.
Um, Optiva also provided our diversity funding for this year. Um, we talked about it at the start of the week. We were able to fund three people from Germany, New Zealand and Adelaide, as well as uh, running a full childcare centre for the week. Um, we checked in on the childcare centres and the children throughout the week and they were all having a fantastic time. Uh, we went and bought them a, a ball so that they go play in the park and um, some books to read and, and they've had a fantastic time as well. Um, we also printed them name badges, I think, um, that we might have tweeted about, I'm not sure. <laughs> But they've had a fantastic time as well. So thank you to Optiva. <laughs> and lastly, to our Fairy Penguin sponsors, GME, uh, Duxtel, Bow and Test and Tag, and Remu Hosting. <laughs> um, now, if I can invite Lee Johnston uh, back to the stage uh, for our charity raffle. Thanks um, very and much. And Erin, if you could please bring down the oversized tin of Chupa Chups full of raffle tickets. <laughs> yeah. I get the drone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I have, a, I have a little bit of a tale to tell about the raffle. The, the first piece of information, of course, is that we have two prizes for the raffle. And uh, I believe we have Mr. Phoenix, delightful hat. Please, please come to the stage. This, this absolutely Hi. wonderful man has donated a, a second, or as some people may like uh, it as a first prize, of his uh, very, very well-travelled hat, which I've had the privilege of wearing on many occasions. <laughs> so, in terms of stats, we sold over 2,900 raffle tickets. You guys are amazing. I'd also like to um, ask you to give a round of applause to Erin and the Rojo Desk team who wrote your names on the raffle tickets. So we sold over $4,800 worth of raffle tickets. And on behalf of the Linux Australia Council, I'm delighted to announce that they have matched that amount dollar for dollar, and I'm very, very pleased to uh, announce to Mr Lee Johnston from Give Where You Live that we've raised $9,680 for Give Where You Live. Do I talk now? Uh, <laughs> Please. Well, thank you. Uh, I was here on Monday and uh, at the launch, and it was great to have the chance to explain to you the importance of what we do in the community. Um, I can tell you now, 100% of that will be going through to our community, to our community partners, who will be supporting numerous causes in our community, the ones that are judged most in need, people who are homeless, people who, families who can't put um, food on the table, so that's absolutely impressive. So thank you. I think that must be almost a record, wouldn't it be? You'd be pretty close it's, to it. It's up there. It's up there, yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, words fail me a little bit. Um, thank you very much. Um, it must have been overwhelming. I've only been here 15 minutes and I've seen graphs and things up there that I just don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, um, I do want to talk to that bloke about the distance and speed thing on the car because my partner has no understanding of that. <laughs> so uh, I will get a copy of that graph, but thank you very much. <laughs> if you're doing nothing tonight, here's a plug, Cathy. There's a fantastic band playing down at Unwind in Belmont. And so you look up Unwind and come up and say hello to me when you're, uh, when you're rocking along having listened to some of our songs, if you're stuck in Geelong tonight. But on behalf of the community, Thank you very much for that. That's an absolutely amazing amount. My pleasure. I'm going to get The first prize, your choice of the Bebop Sky Controller or Mr. Phoenix Delightful Hat, goes to 
you have the glasses on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they don't help much, trust me. I have purple alpha 99 Audrey. Oh my god, Audrey actually won! <laughs> Audrey. Someone you know? <laughs> wow. 210, 210 tickets yes. that Audrey bought. Phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> now, Audrey, I have to ask you a question. Which prize would you prefer? <laughs> maybe, maybe the drone. The drone. Yeah, I the drone. <laughs> but the hat. Congratulations. <laughs> Let's hear it for Audrey. Thank you. The second prize, or should I say equal first prize draw, goes to... <laughs> and again, Kathy. Thank you kindly. We have orange ticket, Bravo 26, Marco Ostini. Is Marco in the house? No, Marco. Oh, Marco. <laughs> Thanks very much, please. Put it on, put it on, put it on. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's hear it again for Audrey and Marco. So this year we were also um, delighted to work with an organisation called 15 Trees that helps events such as ours um, run carbon offset programs. So they, they've worked out um, based on you know how many people are travelling from overseas and um, basically the carbon impact of running a conference such as ours, um, what's needed to offset that. And I'm delighted to say that we've had 123 of you um, de decide to carbon offset. Um, so Sarah Germain from our team will be helping um, the wonderful people at 15 Trees um, plant trees throughout the lawn area, which was recently affected by bushfires. So thank you all for your assistance with that. Um, I have a late addition to the slides that I just remembered about. Um, the Software Freedom Conservancy. Um, we've just heard there is an anonymous donor who will match all donations with LCA by the Bay in the memo field. Um, Software Freedom Conservancy have also recently announced that their um, donation matching from anonymous internet access has been extended until the 1st of March, which means that for all of our delegates, all donations to the Software Freedom Conservancy will be matched twice. Um, it's a fantastic cause um, and we'd like to encourage you to give to that where you can. I would now... <laughs> I, I would now like to invite uh, the new El Presidente, Hugh Blemings, uh, to the stage to share a few short words. Thanks, David. Thanks, Cathy. Um, my name's Hugh Blemings. I have the privilege of being the recently elected uh, President of Linux Australia, the uh, or the um, parent organisation for the conference today. Um, a number of pleasant duties to perform, but we'll come to those two in a moment. Just curious, <laughs> how many of you are actually members of Linux Australia? Okay, I'd encourage you, the rest of you to think about it if you'd be so, be so kind. Um, so a couple of things I want to talk about. There's going to be a bit of software, conservatory, uh, software freedom conservatory theme, as it turns out, because um, I'm reasonably good at maths and I was actually in the session, I can tell that most of you weren't at um, Bradley's talk earlier on today. Uh, if there's one talk that I would encourage you to watch on the, the playback, uh, it would definitely be that one. Um, some very, very important uh, messages in there and uh, something to take away for all of us, so I really would encourage you to, uh, to see that. 
On behalf of the Council, um, I'm pleased to announce that following on some decisions taken by the 2015 Council, we were actually in the process of making a, a, a significant donation from uh, Linux Australia to the Software Freedom Conservatory as well. So I'm not sure whether that will actually mean it so gets multiplied. But And of course, in that vein, I'd, uh, I'd urge all of you to consider contributing individually as well. It's a very, very worthwhile organisation indeed, and there is uh, there is much left to be done uh, for us as a community on that on that front. I've had the good fortune to um, be at every single Linux uh, Cal um, conference of Australian Linux users, from '99 right through to um, to the event today. Um, those of you that have attended um, any, just about any of the other ones would be familiar with the fact that Paul Rusty Russell is uh, quite a mover and shaker and indeed kicked the whole thing off. So I get to wear Rusty's shoes today, which is um, a little bit of an unusual one. One of, the, one of the traditions that Rusty kicked off quite some time ago is uh, working with the speakers of the event is to organise a gift for the two organisers of the conference. <laughs> so um, on behalf of the, the speakers, and I'm sure all the other people involved in the conference. We have a token for you, David. Uh -huh. Thank you. And Cathy's. So please. <laughs> Cathy's give, gift is sufficiently large, we couldn't actually bring it in, so she'll get hers later. But please also thank Cathy Reed for her. <laughs> thank you. So in closing, um, I'd like to thank all of you, all the attendees for coming along, the speakers, uh, the organisation team, you've done a wonderful job and uh, it's a credit to all involved that we really do go from strength to strength each year and look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thanks ever so much. Thank you, Hugh, um, and thank you to our wonderful speakers, that's, that's very kind. Um, Click will work. Uh, now, next year, the future. Um, Chris, you... Hello. Yes, hello. <laughs> Welcome. Um, Chris Nogabau, everyone. Oh, I will take that. You will need that, yes. Yes, uh, I seem to make a habit of coming on stage at this event and talking about conferences. Um, so let's start off by giving a, a huge congratulations to Team Geelong. They've done an amazing job at running a community-driven conference with such a long history. Uh, it's been fantastic this week and it's a real privilege to take over from them. So, uh, for those of you who know me, don't know me, uh, I'm Chris. Uh, you may know me from the former Antarctic bid team, uh, who I'm terribly <laughs> sorry to be abandoning this year. Um, this year, I've uh, actually successfully helped lead a bid for LinuxConf AU uh, to bring it to my home city of Hobart. Uh, so LCA was last in Hobart in 2009, and we'll be taking it back on January 16th to 20th in 2017. Uh, so who here was at Hobart in 2009? Good, quite a lot of you. Well, you might remember a sleepy backwater in a spectacular location wedged between the mountain and the waterfront. In the last seven years, Hobart's changed quite a lot. Since the Museum of Old and New Art moved in five years ago, the city's undergone a transformation driven by artists, craftsmen and makers who've all found great inspiration in their city and surroundings. And we're starting to share that back with the world. There's really no better time for you to come back to Hobart. Our food scene is simply amazing. The world-famous apples that sustained Tasmania through the depression of last century is now fueling a growing craft cider industry. And our craft distilling industry is spectacular. If you fondly remember visits to the Lark Bar back in 2009, you're really going to love Hobart in 2017. Tasmania is now home to more whiskey distilleries than the rest of Australia put together. And they're all doing things that you can't find anywhere else. From those who went and pursued politicians to change the law to pursue their passion, to those who you know, bashed together their entire growing and distillation process in their backyard, Tasmania's produce industry is full of tinkerers, makers and hackers, and we think you'll feel at home in Hobart next year too. And of course, we still have amazing food from, uh, made from local produce and spectacular places to enjoy them from. Hobart in January is wonderful. We have really long evenings, we have days that are warm but not too warm, and a city where everything is in easy reach. Our social program at LCA 2017 is going to let you enjoy everything that Tasmania has to offer. 
and we hope you'll join us. We have an amazing venue at the uh, Rest Point Convention Centre. We're five metres, literally, from Hobart's waterfront. And you'll get to enjoy Ho uh, LCA's hallway track while soaking up great views of the Derwent. It's set on expansive grounds with gardens and we'll be catering all three breaks during the conference, so you'll be able to enjoy some wonderful conversations over lunch right next to Hobart's shoreline. You can stay on site and get wonderful views on the city. Uh, we'll be announcing preferred rates for delegates sometime throughout the year and we'll keep you all posted as to when they're available and how to book them. But if you'd rather stay somewhere cheaper, we've arranged the fantastic Utah's apartments that were so popular in 2009. Uh, they're just up the hill from Rest Point. It's quite a big hill. <laughs> uh, so no matter where you stay, you're going to enjoy Hobart's wonderful setting. So about the conference itself. Linux ConfAU is where the world comes to learn from the best minds in open source and in free software. It's where people come to learn from the people who shape the future of open source. And this year, we encourage you to consider what this future holds. So LCA is always going to be about free software, open systems, and people come here to learn what great things they'll be using and deploying in the new year. So let's come and learn about the future of what you'll be working on. But then there's also fields of endeavor who've discovered the methods that free software and open source movements have, have pioneered and extended them to work in their own fields, be that government or science. Let's talk about how these fields have learned from our movement and how we can work with these fields in the future. Our community has an opportunity to shape how users interact with technology. We need to examine the role that open source has in letting users take control of their own data and to consider how the free software we develop impacts upon our rights, upon our privacy, upon our reputations. And finally, the future poses threats and challenges to the world of free software that we've been working towards, and it's time for our community to question where it's going. Like, why are there so many advocates of open source who are now going back to proprietary platforms rather than free software? Are we failing to meet our own needs as users? Do we still need Linux on the desktop? Have we met? <laughs> Come and talk about it. Has free software missed the boat as a useful thing for end users on mobile? And what can we do about that? Why are we moving back to world, walled gardens for our communication? Why aren't we pursuing federated open protocols anymore? And how can we reverse this decline? It's time we think about these questions and many more. And we invite you to think about the big questions facing open source throughout the coming year. We'll be choosing some amazing keynote presenters who we hope will explore some of these ideas with you. And we'll be directing our program committee to choose great presentations that explore the future of open source. So, Linux Conf AU 2017 will be held in Hobart on January the 16th to the 20th. You can find out more as the year progresses at lca2017.org. And you can track down myself and other organizers on our team, including Craig McWhorter and Michael Cordover, uh, after the conference finishes. So let's see you in Hobart next January. Thank you, Chris. Um, sounds like it's going to be another fantastic LCA next year. Um, so, some numbers. Does anyone want to have a guess? 1.78 terabytes of data. A little lower than I expected. Disappointed. You're going to have uh, to do more next year. <laughs> uh, Sorry, approximately Chris. 250. <laughs> there was a lot more than that. Uh, unique streamers. We were streaming from Tuesday um, and that is the, the number of unique people who, who connected in at some point throughout the week. Uh, 604. <laughs> <laughs> Approximately. Um, that was the number of delegates um, we had registered um, for the week at some point, including uh, day-only ones. 204. I did not write down what that is. That's the number. <laughs> no, no, no. I know that one. That's the number of minutes of sleep I've had this week. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Why are you um, 23 is, um, is the number of countries um, you have all, all travelled from. Four hundred and three litres of beer drank at the PDNS. 
<laughs> well done. <laughs> um, what's next? 1,048. <laughs> uh, unique uh, wireless clients uh, across the week. Again, I expected more. <laughs> it's less than two each. Uh, across 288 access points at the university. Uh, graphs. This is your throughput. Um, curiously, we noticed you use more data during the talk than during the break. <laughs> Didn't know that IRC took that much traffic. <laughs> um, and a graph of our wireless clients. Um, I think you might have slept in a couple of days. <laughs> um, some thank yous to our, our wonderful keynotes. Um, they, they started off our, our days with fantastic, insightful uh, presentations, very thought-provoking. Um, Thank you for, for joining us at LinuxConf and hopefully you'll come back again. Let's hear it for George, Katerina, Jono and Genevieve. Again, our wonderful speakers and Miniconf orgs. Um, there was slightly over 80 of you in total. Um, as I said before, without you this conference wouldn't be possible. So thank you. <laughs> Uh, the Linux Confeu Ghosts and Papers Committee. Um, you've you've been voices of reason, um, <laughs> except when you didn't stop us from doing this. <laughs> Where were you then? Um, it, it, you've provided um, fantastic guidance and assistance throughout the year. Um, our Papers Committee as well for reviewing all of the submissions um, and helping build the wonderful program that we're able to share with you this week. So thank you. Here, here. For, for those of you who may not know, Papers Committee happens a little bit like this. You have about a dozen people fly in from you know, all over the region into, um, uh, into a conference room, very generously donated by Rackspace this year. And we're locked in for an entire day. And we have to go through the CFP submissions and we basically wrestle it out. Who gets into the conference and who doesn't? This year, that was an incredibly tough process. We had almost 300 CFP submissions. If you were a speaker this year, you had less than a one in three chance of getting into the program. That is the calibre that we have in Geelong in 2016. And a huge thank you to the Papers Committee. Uh, to our network team, um, both the, the Deacon staff, so Andrew, uh, Megan Mathers, uh, Evil Steve, who's, who's been here um, for a little over a couple of weeks now, um, nutting out all of the network. He, he didn't get his evil plan off the ground, which I think he's probably a little upset about, um, but, but he'll get over it, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear it for our network team. <laughs> I'll pay for that one later. Uh, to our fantastic AV team as well, um, Ryan, Tim, Carl, um, the whole team, they've, they've done a fantastic job um, and they've, they've iterated throughout the week. So we started off just making sure that we had the recordings. Then on Tuesday morning they made sure we had streaming going out to the internet. Um, and then they've progressively upgraded rooms to try and get HD um, in as many of the places as possible as well. Uh, the videos will be up um, shortly and I'll go through those details as well. They're already going up, oh, fantastic. Um, to our core team um, for putting up with me, droning on about things week after week, um, bugging you, finding out when you'd book the buses or when you'd, when you'd organise the childcare, or all of the details um, that, you, that you helped sort out, it's, it's been fantastic. To Cathy as well um, for, for being a fantastic support, um, making sure that we stayed on track. Thank My you. Absolute pleasure. Um, to our volunteers, um, if you've been wearing an orange shirt, an orange LCA shirt that is, because there is other ones, um, at all throughout the week, could I please ask you to stand up as well? All the volleys, please stand up.
Linux.com.au is an entirely volunteer-run conference. Um, without the people you, you see in the orange shirts around you, um, it wouldn't be possible. They're, they're the ones making sure that you, you file in in the morning, that you get your badge on your first day, that you e-bag, that it's got all of the things that it should have in it, um, that all of the talks are recorded, that the questions are asked appropriately, that people have microphones run from one corner of the room to the other, um, and, and without them it wouldn't be possible. So thank you again. I mentioned our videos earlier. Um, we've had 250 unique streamers throughout the week. 6,000 minutes of streamed video have already been watched. The videos are already being uploaded to YouTube and to the Linux Australia Mirror. Uh, the Mirror link is mirror.linux.org.au uh, or you can find us on YouTube, just search linux.com.au 2016. Uh, so thank you for the AV team for, for getting those up so quickly. Um, Tim has asked me to give you a quick plug for some of the equipment that we've been using. Um, it's FOSS hardware, capturing FOSS conferences. It's HDMI to USB. Uh, they need your help. Um, if you want to go to HDMI to USB.tv, uh, I know Tim would, would love some assistance with that as well, with that project. So thank you. And that's that. That's Geelong, Linux.com.au 2016. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I look forward to seeing you all again next year in Hobart. Um, and best of luck to Chris and the team. Let's hear it for Chris and the team. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful year, and until we can meet again in Hobart next year, all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Now, when Katie says she's going to embarrass someone, she really means it. Thank you, everyone. We Thank hope you, you have a wonderful, uh, a wonderful journey back to your to your hometowns. For many of you, that's tens of thousands of miles away, and uh, we wish you an incredibly safe journey and an incredibly safe return. We'll see you all next year. Thank you.